welcome to the signal path. I've received a lot of messages and emails from you guys asking me to show uh, an example of repairing an equipment that I've bought broken. Uh, so well this time I decided to, to do just that and show you how I go about fixing something that's broken if I want to add something to my lab. Now I'm going to do this uh, with you guys on screen time. I don't know if I can actually fix this particular equipment or not but I'm going to try and see what happens. So I have a, a few power supplies in my lab, but none of them go to really high voltages. I wanted to do some experiments and I needed something about 50 volts or so. My uh, Rego power supply goes up to 32 volts and it gives me um, up to 5 amps. But I did come across this Agilent power supply, which is a 200 watt power supply. It's really heavy. Uh, it can give you 50 volts up to 4 amps. So that's uh, 200 watts. But it doesn't work, it's broken. So I wanted to know if it's, there's a way to fix it uh, cheaply and uh, see what happens. So I've done a little bit of fiddling around with it already, but I'm going to walk you through it. And what I want you to get from this is my thought process and what I do to go about figuring out what could be wrong with it. And then we'll dig out some uh, data sheets and some schematics and then see if uh, we can fix it. So let's get started. Let's take a closer look at this power supply. All I've done so far is that I've taken the case off. Nothing exciting about that, so I didn't record that part. It's just a case that goes around it. You open two screws and uh, it just slides right off. The front of the power supply, I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with. I've shown it in my other videos. It's uh, the typical Agilent setup. This is an E3634A model. As I mentioned, it goes up to 50 volts and 4 amps. It has only a single output and it has the sense ports like the Regal power supply does. Everything else is uh, typical, you can switch between 25 or 50 volts and in 25 volts it goes up to 7 amps. So there's a lot of power, it can give you a lot of power. Um, in that, as typical, the buttons on uh, inputs and outputs, disable the limit, to show you can see what kind of uh, settings it has. So nothing really exciting, so I'm going to power it down to show you what happens. Now as soon as you open it, the very first thing you notice is of course the gigantic transformer. It's a linear supply, so it has a nice transformer in the middle for a very clean output. There's also four big heat sinks here in the middle, and these are where the output uh, transistors, output regulators would be, and there's a fan to blow air on them. So if you're dissipating 200 watts, uh, you, would dis you will be dissipating some power in these guys. So you would definitely want them cooled. The main circuit board is sitting underneath all of that mess, which makes it actually really difficult to reach. So I'm going to have to think about how I'm going to do that later. At the back of this whole thing, Excuse me while I shift this, it is quite heavy. We have an exposed uh, PCB that has pretty much absolutely no components on it. All the, other, all the components are on the other side. But you can see some nice features. For example, nice power and ground planes and nice thick lines connected to the output. And you can see some mesh pattern in the inner layers of the PCB. You can also see that obviously there must have been a mistake on this board because there is this uh, wire going around so they've made some correction. And it must be an older model so they haven't reflected that into the PCB. Uh, that's about it on the back. But I did notice something while I was looking at it. I noticed that if you look closely, for example, there are all kind of test ports and all kind of uh, node voltages labeled all around here. For example, all these guys are labeled. So I can immediately see that it may not be so hard to find the problem because if everything is labeled so nicely, I can just go ahead and probe them while it's powered on to see if they function. But of course, that would, should not be the first step. The first step should be to, well, turn it on and see what is wrong with it and what happens when we turn it on. If it doesn't smoke and burst into flames, then we have a chance. So I'm going to plug it in. Make sure first that it's turned off. Plug this guy in. I cannot see what I'm doing. Because the camera is in the way. Here we go. So now it's plugged in. And I'm going to first turn it on. All hands off. Just turn it on and see what happens. Well, it makes some noises. Doesn't seem to be smoking, which is good. So let me shift the camera to show you what the front panel is saying. I always have to be careful shifting something that's plugged in. All right, here we go. 
well it says output off that's good the display seems to be working the display is really dim it may not show up uh, on camera but I think the reason the display is so dim is that this thing must have been left on for a very very long time uh, this is a vacuum fluorescent display of course and these things age with time if you leave them on for a long time they start to dim and get darker my other IGN supplies have much brighter displays because I tend to always keep them off if I'm not using them of course you shouldn't keep them on anyway because we're wasting a lot of electricity so I'm going to enable the output and here you go that's the problem it says 63.66 volts 8.163 amps of course that's impossible because it's connected to nothing and uh, I haven't done anything and turned all the knobs it makes the sound that is uh, typical of uh, something switching but I turn I to play the display button turn on and off again no nope. no chance 63.66 volts and 8.1 amps well that's definitely broken so the next thing I can do is I can connect the outputs to the multimeter to see if it actually generates any voltage at all so let me turn it off put it down Ugh. there we go let me set up the camera a little bit better so I'm going to use my uh, Regal um, six and a half digit multimeter this has uh, become my favorite multimeter uh, because it's uh, extremely reliable and it works really well a lot of built-in features I'll, I'll review that uh, at some time in the future so what I want to do is I want to turn this on and just measure the output voltage and see if there is anything at all that comes out of the power supply. There we go. So there's the supply right now connected to nothing. These are the, the probes. So I'm going to turn the power supply on. I'm connecting the probes to the outputs of the power supply. It's reading 0.6 volts when the output is disabled that's already not a very good sign because it's supposed to read uh, well it's supposed to read nothing it's supposed to read zero so let me turn the output on no change let me rotate the knob no nope, absolutely nothing turn it back off turn the whole thing off and it still has 0.5 volts i guess the output capacitor is charged and for some interesting reason it went up a little bit turn back on no nope, 0.59 so well the output doesn't work neither so it means to me that the problem isn't simply the display the problem is something more fundamental internally to the equipment itself because if the display was bad at least I may be able to read the correct voltage when I turn it on and the display might just be showing the wrong value but as it turns out the problem must be more serious because I get absolutely nothing well there is something we can do to at least point us in the right direction for example I know that all Agilent equipment most of Agilent equipment and their power supplies all have built-in self-test and in order to do a built-in self-test on a power supply you just hold the on and off button while you power the unit on it will do a self-test and if it fails it'll give you an error code so let's see Testing, failed, and I would love to see the error. Here we go, error. Okay, error 632. So it generated one error. I believe this is only one. Yeah, there's only one error. And we just cleared that error. So error 632. That, of course, means nothing until you go look at the data sheet. I have already done that. So I'm going to grab the data sheet and we're going to see what error 632 actually means. Go. I have the documentation here and I went through it and I printed some of the pages that are relevant so here it is it says oh it's the wrong page these are all the errors 601 602 and it goes all the way to 632 632 is actually the last error here you go and I'll read it to you it says hardware test failed this test checks the status of voltage and current error amplifiers for the power circuit 
if both amplifiers are not operational, the power supply will beep, the error uh, um, annunciator would be on. Annunciator. I'm having difficulty reading this. So this tells me that, so based on this message, it is saying that the power circuit has failed. So now I have to figure out well, what, what is the power circuit. Well, luckily, there is a block diagram of this instrument. And about in the block diagram, we have several main sections. So the way the power supply works is that it's a typical architecture, nothing fancy about it. It has a digital section, it has an output section, which is floating because you have an isolated negative terminal. And here is where the voltage regulation happens. And there's DACs and ADCs that monitor the error voltage and set the actual voltage that you want. And there's a bunch of digital circuitry that controls everything and controls the ADCs and allows you to talk to GPIB and all, all the other um, things. And there's a, the transformers right here. So there's bias supplies. And if I, if I read the manual a little bit more, you see that the bias supply is actually part of the power um, section of the whole circuit. So in here it has a bunch of regulators minus 5 volts, plus 5 volts, minus plus and minus 15, and then plus and minus 17. And it says that the plus and minus 17 volts are for the display. Well the display already works, so it turns on, so that should be good. And then there is plus and minus 5 volts and plus and minus 15 volts. This section of the power supply is seems to be the section that it is complaining about because it's telling me that there's something wrong with the biasing because the DAX and the ADC bias voltages amplifiers don't work. So after looking at this, I went and I looked around and I found the schematic of the entire power supply. It's several pages and it's, I've printed it. You cannot really read it on this size, but anyhow, they're all here. And I found the section of the power supply, which is re responsible for the bias supply. So the bias supply circuit is actually quite simple. It gets directly from the transformer is rectified, goes through a few regulators, and then it goes through a few Zener diodes. And these Zener diodes then give me minus 15. You can't read it. I'll just read it for you. Minus 15, minus 17. Uh, and there is plus 17, plus 15, and there is plus and minus 5 volt. So the entire bias circuit is in this part of the circuit. Now, I need to find out where this is on the PCB because this doesn't really help me. Well, guess what? I can do that very easily also. Here it is. The location of all the components of the PCB that's underneath all the other components. So all I need to do is to come to my schematic and, for example, look for a component. Let's say looking for these inner diodes and I see CR9 as an example, and you'll see why I'll pick that one later. And if you look around and you spend about 25 minutes and about a couple of bottles of beer, you will eventually be able to find that component. And I found it and it is right here, that's CR9. So it's around this location of the circuit where the biasing happens. Well, remember I showed you the back of the instrument before? And I showed you that the back of the instrument has all these labels. Now it's upside down, but that's okay. Right here, you see it says upside down, it says plus 15 volts, minus 17.4 volts, plus 17.4 volts. So in this region, I can probe and look and make sure that all these voltages are okay. If any of those voltages are not okay, that means that something has failed in this circuit. So let's do that. You guys are getting a, a, a very rapid debugging. It took me a little bit longer than <laughs> explaining it to you, but at least you see the process. So I'm going to turn this upside down and toward myself. Great. And I will plug it in again. But please, if you ever attempt something like this, you have to be extremely careful because there's live voltages on these PCBs. You can't put your hand on it. You have to be very cautious. And if you have never done this before, at least do it with somebody who is qualified, who knows what they're doing, because I would hate for you to get hurt. All right, so here are the regions I'm interested in probing. You can see, I'll, I'll, sh I'll point to them. So for example, here's a plus 17.4. I know that should work because based on the schematic, that's for the display and the display does work. 
there's plus 15 minus 17.4 volts and if you spin a little bit this way here's minus 15 and a bunch of other voltages so I'm going to turn this on again like so okay so now it's live I will ground my negative terminal and I will begin measuring the all the other uh, voltages so for you guys to see instead of showing you this I'll show you what I'm reading and I'll tell you what it is that I'm probing I wish there was a better way to do this so you guys could see everything simultaneous I guess I would need two cameras okay so let's see I'm going to probe plus 17.4 because I know that one works we find a good ground here's my ground there you go so the plus 17.4 is returning 18 which is a little bit high but doesn't seem to be too much of a problem uh, let's see minus 15 there you go minus 15 perfect so I'm gonna probe uh, let's say the 5 volt one oops that's not the 5 volt one sorry about that let me look for a 5 volt here is minus 17.4 I'm not sure if I did that already sorry this is a plus 17.4 it's 18 we measured that here is minus 5 that's what I was looking for here is minus 5.1 perfect that one's also okay Here's plus 5 volts here. It's hard to get these things to work. Okay, let me see what else is left here. And here's plus 15. Alright, so here's the problem. Actually, this is what I was looking for first. There it is. That's the 5 volt. That's the one I was mentioning. I couldn't find it. So here's 5 volts. Now, if I probe plus 15 it's giving me minus 0 0.8 so I'm probing plus 15 and it's reading minus 0 0.8 so let me go back to the circuit here we go this is what I was probing so I probed plus and minus 17 you already saw that and this is the plus 15 right here that I was probing and instead of reading plus 15 he was telling me minus 0 0.8 so that obviously doesn't make sense something is wrong so I went ahead and I dug the schematic out again so let me turn this off so that we don't shock ourselves here we go so I looked everywhere and I found the plus 15 output here it is let me see if I can get this to focus here's plus 15 you see that so plus 15 comes around, comes through a Zener diode that's labeled CR9. But on the other side of the Zener diode, so if I go out, this voltage, 17.4 volts, is okay. But this voltage, plus 15 volts, is not okay. So if this side of the Zener diode is okay and that side of the Zener diode is not okay, that tells me that, well, there's something either wrong with this guy or something is wrong with this guy. So why well, I have to investigate this CR9 and this other one which is CR45 and make sure they're okay and I have mentioned before that I did find them on this schematic and this uh, location of the components I found out that CR9 is right here is next to these big guys in fact if you look at this there's this connector P6 that connector is this connector P6 it focuses you will see it there it is that's p6 so cr9 the zener diode should be exactly on the opposite side of the board right next to this connector right around this area so now i have to turn it around and find a way to get to that little guy let's see i can't even see anything but there is the, this is the connector, this guy, there we go. This, this wire here connects to the connector. 
So somewhere underneath this mess is our CR9. In fact, actually, we may be able to even see it from here. Maybe not, but anyhow, it's in there somewhere. So give me a few minutes, let me find a way to get to that PCB and I'll take it apart and then uh, we'll see if that component is indeed broken. So I succeeded in taking the whole board out of uh, the case, which was, uh, well, not so straightforward. Uh, but I had to take the transformer out uh, and everything else is sitting on the other side of the room now. So on this board, I have managed to find a component that I think I need to replace. So let me adjust this camera. Here. Now, unfortunately, the component that I need to replace is extremely hard to get to. Component, if this guy will ever focus, is this guy. Is this one that component right at the tip of the screwdriver that's CR9 you can actually probably see the label quite clearly on it now CR9 that's a xenodiode and uh, if you look actually closely enough at it you will notice that the surface looks a little bit different than the other ones other components nearby I think it's it is indeed burnt out I don't know why it's burnt out but maybe has a bigger underlying problem that I cannot know at the moment but what I can do is I can try and replace that and somehow uh, solder a new one now I knew that this component oops I knew that this component was uh, broken from before so I went ahead and, and I did the initial tests before so I went ahead and ordered from DigiKey a few replacement ones, it's replacement diodes, they were really cheap, I think they were maybe 50 cents or so, so I have a bunch of them here, uh, it arrived uh, yesterday, so we'll take a look, I only ordered five, I can imagine that the DigiKey employees must be pretty annoyed when somebody orders uh, just a few of these, but uh, because they have to go ahead and pack them, so anyhow, they're, they look like these, you can see they look just like uh, the ones in the package, right? the ones in the in the equipment. There they are. So I can take one of them out and um, try and solder it. Well, I would imagine soldering it is not as hard as unsoldering the one that's already on the board. So I have to think of uh, some strategy to get to it. These heat sinks are in the way, but the heat sinks are really difficult to take off because there are regulators that are screwed onto it and I would have to do undo all of those which unfortunately I may not have a choice considering um, that they are completely in the way so but there are these ones that have the capacitors in front of them so it's not as as easy as it seems that's an interesting I wonder how they have assembled this I would since you can't reach through here to reach the screws maybe they put these down soldered them last after everything else has been placed down uh, but uh, either way it's going to be a quite a bit of a challenge to do that so I'm going to try and unsolder it once I get somewhere I'll show you the result so in order to make unsoldering this component easier I actually tried I'm going to try and crack the case open I'm gonna break the component apart while it's on the PCB hopefully I won't damage anything else and then, uh, so this is the component I'm trying to remove. You can see I have this uh, uh, little scissor on top of it. So I'm going to try and break it into a few pieces and then uh, unsolder it one pin at a time so that I can, uh, I can actually get it out because there's no way I can properly heat it with my soldering iron. I need a hot air knife, which I don't have. So let me see if this is even possible. I need to find a way to reach it. Perhaps this is not the best tool to use. There we go. Don't know if you can see it in video or not, but half of it is gone. Well, 
There goes the other half. So I may have damaged the PCB, but not so bad that it's unrepairable. Alright. Let me clean this up a little bit. I'll be back. Okay, I went ahead and I uh, replaced the diode with uh, some great difficulty. In the process of breaking the old one off, I actually removed one of the pads. But that pad is not being used anyway, so now the diode is being held with only two of its pins. But I think given the cramped location and uh, all the difficulty and everything that was around, I think it's uh, turned out uh, relatively well. You can see, kind of get an idea of uh, what I was doing. So I had to reach in this little area uh, to be able to do that. So it was, uh, oh, I'm holding the camera in my hand. So it wasn't uh, the easiest thing to do. But now I'm going to put it all back together and uh, turn it back on and see if it works. And uh, if you were wondering, I maybe should add a little comment here. This cable that runs from uh, this side of the board to this side of the board is only there because the output is generated to the back. But because it's so much current and so much voltage being delivered to the load, they actually did this jumper manually with thick gauge wires so they're not to have any resistance drop across the PCB so they didn't want to do it with traces. You can see this, uh, this, this one, this thick copper port here, that's the ground on the other side. I, we saw before was the VDD. So anyway, that's what that was. It was kind of on the way, so I taped it on the side. But let's see if this was uh, the only problem and if uh, my little repair uh, fixed the problem. All right, and with the magic of television, I have reassembled this thing back together. It took about 10 minutes to put it back together. Not so bad. Everything fit, no extra screws. That's always a good sign. So I've plugged it in again. And if you remember, this was the, oh, this was the spot that was giving me the wrong voltage. So I wanted to see 15 volts here and I wasn't getting 15 volts. So I'm going to measure it again. I haven't measured it yet. So I'm going to go back to the multimeter. Here's the multimeter. I'm powering on the instrument. And I will measure to see if we have. So let me test something else to make sure that's okay. Here's a uh, 18 volts, perfect. It should be minus 18 on this one. Sorry, oh, actually, you know what? I did measure the 15 volts. Never mind. Here it is 14.59. Now we have 15 volts. Before it used to be minus 0.8. So it seems like the diode, the Zener diode, is doing its thing. Now there's only one last test to do, and it is to turn it on and see if it still says 61 volts or some random number. Let me zoom out here and let me flip this guy over. There we go. Let's see what it says. Putting it back in. Power. Actually, let me run a self test on it. Pass! Unbelievable! And here you go, zero volts, perfect! No problems. Well, that's not so bad, let me actually just measure the voltage to make sure it really is giving us voltage. So I'm going to plug in the negative, plug in the positive. If you remember before it used to say 0 0.6 volts no matter what. Now, Let's see, I'm going to turn it on, I'm going to go to 1 volt. How about that? Unbelievable, 2 volts. Let me go to 25 volts, perfect. Now I'm going to try 50 volts. Which is its maximum setting. And 49.98. Phenomenal. I am extremely happy that uh, this unit has been repaired. So you can see here, 50 volts. And the total cost of repair, less than 50 cents and about an hour and a half. And all I needed was a single multimeter, a soldering iron, and a diode, and of course the manual data sheet online. So you can see that sometimes you get lucky, like this time. That doesn't mean that every time I've bought something I've been able to fix, but 
if you look carefully, you may be able to find something and repair. So now I am going to add this uh, 50 volt supply to my lab. I can clean it up a little bit and it's ready to go. And hopefully I can come up with uh, a new experiment to use this little guy and uh, put it through the test. Of course, I just did a quick voltage test. I have to put it through loads and check its rise and fall times, make sure everything's okay. But first, it looks good.